Praise the name of the Lord. For the Lord is good. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord God. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I pray that you're ready for a time of praise and worship. Those that are here with us in the auditorium, those that are meeting with us online, may the Lord richly bless you. We know that you're going to be blessed. Can we give the Lord a praise offering? Those that are here with us, hallelujah. Say thank you to the Lord, for He is good. He never leaves nor forsakes us. Amen. He is faithful. And I pray that you've got your communion ready. I pray that those that are online will have their communion ready there in their home. Come ready as we hear the word of the Lord in a few minutes' time. But let us go into a time of praise and worship. Let's seek the face of God. Let's please God. You know, friends, let us be God pleasers. Amen? Amen. So many want to be a man pleaser. No, I want to please God. Amen. I want my life to please God. Yes. Hallelujah. I pray that you did that assignment today. Go out and be kind. <laughs> Go out and be merciful. Amen. I pray that you have been kind and merciful to those that have, you have come into contact with today and showing that love to each one that you meet. Amen. Amen. Let's lift our hands to heaven. Father, we just bless you. We honor you. We love you, Lord God. We thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace. Thank you, Lord God, that you take over this service right now. Have your perfect will and way. Move by your power and by your spirit, I pray. Lord God, I thank you, Father God, for an anointing that will break every yoke, I pray. Thank you, Father God, that you touch the hearts and the lives of your people. Thank you, Lord God, as we prepare ourselves for a time of communion around the table of the Lord. I pray for an anointing that will break every yoke, I pray. Thank you, Father God. Anoint the hands and the feet that play these instruments. Anoint the voices, Lord God. And I pray, Father God, that everything that is said and done here this afternoon will bring glory and honor to your name, I pray. We thank you for this now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. I want you to turn around and wave at those that are here in the back of you and those that are in the front of you. Wave at one another and be a blessing. Wave at somebody on the other side of the mound. In Jesus' mighty name, let's go for it.
thank you for your breath that you have breathed into us, Father God. We can't go without your living breath, Father God, without your living word, Father God, without you in our lives, Father God. And as long as we have breath in our lungs, Father God, we're going to praise you. And even after that, Father God, we're going to still praise you, Father God. We're going to lift our hands and we're going to worship you until one day when we meet with you, Father God. Hallelujah, Father God. We thank you for your presence in this place this afternoon, Father God. Thank you for your presence in the homes that are people who are worshiping you, Father God. I pray that as we worship you as one, Father God, that our worship is a sweet, sweet smile into your throne room this afternoon.
We can just worship you and worship you all day long. We Thank love you, your Mother. presence, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank We're going to get Jesus. straight into the word this afternoon. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Father God, as your word gets ministered this afternoon. I pray that I will hide behind the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord God, I thank you for the privilege to even speak the words that have, have been given to us from the Father. And Lord God, I thank you that we will hear the heart of the Father to the church tonight. In Jesus' name, and all the gods, kings, and priests gave a great big amen. Hallelujah. The one who loves you most knows you the best. Do you know sometimes if somebody really knows you well, they go, yeah, I know that one. I know, I know all about them. And God knows you the best. And he loves you the most. He loves you with all your flaws and all your good points and high points. He loves you so very, very much. And I was wanting us this afternoon to turn to John chapter 5. And we're going to read a story there. But I was just considering John, considering this amazing disciple. And throughout scripture, when you study John as a scholar, you'll find out that John never mentions himself by name. He never calls him, he never says, hey, this is, I'm the writer of John and this is John never, never says his name. The only thing he calls himself is the disciple who Jesus loved. The one who knew him the best loved him the most. He, he is almost like the secret service disciple. But there's one thing that John does. He talks about John the Baptist, but he himself is invisible. And the other one that he talks about is Jesus. He is invisible, but he makes Jesus completely visible to us. And many times when we are counseling people who just newly come to the Lord, we say, read the gospel of John. And it is because John takes his whole, his whole reflection of God and he just puts it all on Jesus. And he talks all about of how amazing Jesus is. And we're going to look here in John chapter 5. There's a story here uh, about a man who I believe represents many of us. During a Jewish feast in, in uh, Jerusalem, Jesus visits Bethesda, where there is a pool of sick people in John chapter 5. Sick people laying by this pool, waiting for the angel of God to stir the waters that they could get into the pool and be healed. There's a man there and also an invisible man because it does not give his name. A man that needs healing. And he was sitting there for 38 years. My goodness me. How many of you are over the age of 38? Me. 38 years. Now take 38 years and minus that off your life if you are 38. Imagine 38 years sitting by the pool waiting for the angel of the Lord to stir the waters. He said, I have no help, no one to help me to get into the pool when the water is stirred. And the man was avoiding responsibility, his own responsibility. I think, I think it would have been a matter of drop and roll, boy. Like, take your blanket and roll. <laughs> like, sit on the edge, and when you see that angel, just clunk, you know. Like, how eager are you to get into that pool? The problem here is that he blamed other people for himself not being healed. He said, "There's nobody, there's nobody to carry me." What are the excuses that we keep ourselves away from God? In John chapter 5 and verse 7, here's Jesus. Uh, Sir, the invalid replied to Jesus. He said, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am on my way, someone else 
goes in before me. Then Jesus told him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. (laughs) Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Immediately the man was made well. He picked up his mat and began to walk. Now this happened on the Sabbath. You can just see the stories unfolding when they say that that happened on the Sabbath. Hallelujah. Experiencing the fullness of the life that Jesus came to die for for you means that you need to start up today by getting up. You may have circumstances in your life right now where you feel like there's no other choice but to just sit down or even lie down. If that's the case, tell yourself, I'm going to be getting up. Getting up in the inside. Get up on the inside. You've got to get up on the inside before you can get up on the outside. There's something inside of you where faith breaks through and reaches the hand of heaven where you get up on the inside before you physically stand up on the outside. Sometimes we want to see a physical miracle, but we need to first get up on the inside and full, be full of faith and full of hope again. Make up your mind that you're never going to quit, that you are going to get up. The devil might have come to bash you down. The devil might have tried to pin all kinds of things upon you, anxiety, depression, all kinds of evil things that are from the pits of hell. But Jesus says, get up, get up. Jesus speaks very sternly when he says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. What is your fix? What is your mat? Are you going to take up your mat or are you going to just lay there and let your mat take you? (laughs) And there's something interesting. Normally in the Bible, it's like a bit of Disneyland. It's like, let it go, let it go. But now Jesus actually tells them, like those other guys, like leave your cloak and run. But this is one time where Jesus actually says to the man, pick up your mat and walk. Pick up your mat and walk. So you can just imagine this guy now. He can walk, and now he's on his hands and knees. He's rolling up his mat, and he's got his mat, and now he's got his mat. He picks up his mat, and he's walking. You know what? What is your mat? Your mat is your testimony. Next time you have to go walking into a, a meeting or a boardroom or, uh, or anything that you have to go stand before lots of people, bring your mat with. Your mat is your testimony. So many times at the church, we want to maybe judge somebody who's been on a mat. Maybe you say, oh, that person, oh, that one was a prostitute. Oh, you know, that one did drugs. Or, oh, you know, that one. You know what? That's their mat. That's their testimony because they can say, you know what? Once I was blind, but now I can see. Once I was lame, but now I can walk. This is my mat, and I no longer need it because I took the hand of the hand of Jesus. Jesus is standing right in the midst of us with the outstretched hand this afternoon. He's calling and he's saying to you in the weakness, the weakest place of your life right now, he's saying, get up. Let go of that thing that holds you down. He says, get up. He wants to be your helper and your friend. He did not say, get up and let go of the mat. He says, Pick up your mat. Pick up your testimony. To succeed in life, in our spiritual growth, there is something that is very crucial. And I believe it is this. There's no such thing as just staying still. If you're staying still in your relationship with God, you're backsliding. You're either going forward or you're going backwards. So if you think you're standing still, you're not. It is time to move forward and get deeper into the things of God. What does standing still do? Standing still stagnates water. And water becomes rotten when it is stagnating and not moving forward. Live and move and have your being inside of the Lord Jesus. In Samuel 
chapter 2 and verse 9, there's a very interesting story, and it goes like this. Now, David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? There was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. Cool name. So they called him and to David, the king, and said to him, Are you Ziba? Hmm, he said, at your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone in the house of, of Saul to whom I may show kindness of God? Is there still someone in the household of Saul whom I can show kindness to? Is there somebody listening to the gospel this afternoon who the Lord still wants to show some kindness to? It is the kindness of Jesus that healed that man. It is the kindness that leads us to repentance. Hear the voice of the king and he wants to show kindness to you today. And we go forward. And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Malchah, the son of Emil, in Lodabar. Okay. Then the king sent and brought him out of the house of Makar to the son of Almira from Lodabar. Lodabar, that word means no pasture. Brought him out of that place. And if you think about it, David was a shepherd. But Ziba finds somebody in a place with no pasture. And if we are without Jesus, we are wandering as without a pasture. Now, when Meshibbethe, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, so Saul's grandson, came to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself before David and said, Meshib, David said, Meshibbethe, and he answered, here is your servant. You can imagine everybody in that family was like murdered because of the war and all of those things that happened. And Meshibbethsheth probably thought that he was so unworthy to be before David that he thought he was also probably going to just be killed right there. And he was lame in his feet because if you read the story, because of the war, his, his mom was carrying him as a little guy and she was running away from people that were chasing her and she fell and she, she fell onto him and he was crippled in his feet from that. And they had hidden him all of these years. And here he stands before David. And so David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you the land of, your, of Saul, your grandfather. And you shall eat bread at my table continually. And the story goes on. And how he comes to the table of the king. And he was a cripple. But yet, David showed kindness to him. Sin may have crippled you. You're, you may be having this mat that looks like a little bit dirty. But you know what? When Meshubadeth sat at the table with everybody else, he sat down and he put his legs under the table. And when he was sitting there eating and conversing with everybody, he looked just like everybody else. His his uh, shame was covered by the table and our shame this afternoon is covered by the table uh, the crippleness of sin is under the blood and you are restored you are healed you you can eat at the king's table this afternoon and all the things all the brokenness it is not just covered by the blood of bulls and goats but completely restored by jesus himself as we see in the New Testament where the man actually gets up and walks 
And that same man that gets up and walks and his ankle bones aren't broken like Mishibosheth, he, he sits at that table restored with Jesus if he sat down and had, had lunch with Jesus. And as we go, we have a testimony, but the sin is taken away. Hallelujah. In verse 8, he bowed himself and he said, What is this, your servant, that you should look upon him as such a dead dog? He had so much shame, and you may have so much shame, and you want to run away from the Father. But remember what I said, that the one who loves you most knows you the best. And the king called Ziba to Saul's servant and said to him, I have given to your master the son that belongs to Saul and his house, and therefore and your, son, your sons and your servants shall work the land, and you shall bring in the harvest that the master's sons may have food to eat. But Meshavosheth, your master's sons shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. That's just this, that. And how much provision came from the hand of David towards the, the family of Saul, which was his enemy. And if we would just turn to God our, our own, in our own weaknesses, in our own strength, we can't make it. We can't make it on our own. The only way we can come to the Father is through grace. And in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you could change anything, let it be your heart, that your heart would stand before the, before the Lord. It is only by grace that we have any good merits with the Father. It is only by the grace of God that we can be free. Allow Christ to live through you and to make you a better Christian than you were yesterday. Don't stay still. Don't stagnate. Move forward. This morning, Pastor said, encouraged us to be kind to our enemies, to be kind to those who have persecuted us or hated in any way. Stretch out your hand and be kind to those who are in need and just extend yourself more than you ever have before. Remember, it is no longer I that lives, but the Christ that lives in me. And like John, we could completely disappear and just let Jesus be the message of our lives. In Romans 8 verse 33, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Is it God who justifies? Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of the Father and makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ? Shall tribulation, shall coronavirus, shall distress, shall poverty, shall pa famine, shall nakedness or sword, shall distress, famines, peril? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long and we counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, and all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is inside of Christ Jesus. And even as we come to a place of communion, I want you to examine your heart as if you were the man by the pool or Meshubasheth. Lord Jesus, we look at our hearts this afternoon and we see a brokenness. We see our failures and our faults. And Lord Jesus, we know that we don't even have to come to you in shame. We can come to you asking for forgiveness and thanking you for your grace. Lord God, I thank you that you'll forgive us for any sin in our life. 
Lord Jesus, take us and wash us and make us whiter than snow. Father God, I thank you that it will be no longer us that lives, but the Christ will be seen living inside of us. In the mighty name of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats of the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And we do not want to eat in an in a unworthy manner. We want to come to the table knowing that our sins are washed far away. Let a man examine himself and let him eat, eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are sick among you, and many fall asleep. For if we would judge ourselves, not someone else, if we would judge who? Ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. And I want you to take a moment this afternoon and judge your own heart and then take those weaknesses to God and see him picking you up like he did with the man at the pool. Lord Jesus, I thank you that as we examine our hearts, Lord Jesus, that you begin a new work inside of us, a new healing. And Lord God, I thank you, Father God, that sin will be washed away. And Lord God, I pray that as the sin is gone, we're going to see a moving forward and we're going to see a healing. And just like that fire that is kicked up again and the flames begin to burn again, that all those dead heavy things will fall off and the life of Christ would be renewed inside of us. Hallelujah. In verse 33 of 1 Corinthians 11, it says, Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. So I want to take a moment now just to close our eyes and simply wait. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for forgiving us and for the power of your Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as we take this bread in our hands, we remember the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was crushed and broken so that we could be restored and healed. Lord Jesus, we hold this bread in our hands and we remember your sacrifice and the work of the cross, the work of Calvary, your body that was broken for us, that we may have life. And Lord God, I thank you that even on Sundays as the church around the world breaks the body of Christ, that the church will be ready for the day that you come to call us home. And Lord God, I thank you. As we partake now, we remember you in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Do you know that Jonathan had a covenant with David? Jonathan and David were the best friends ever in the Bible. And Jesus has a covenant with you. Jesus has a covenant of blood with you that restores you to the Father. Like Meshubosheth was restored right into the king's palaces where he belonged. God wants to restore you right to where you belong. This cup is the new covenant, a covenant that Jesus has with you. The new covenant in my blood. Do this Drink this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. And as we drink the cup this afternoon, we're going to remember the covenant that we have in the Lord Jesus. Let us partake together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your blood. Thank you for the power of your blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your blood, Lord God, washes all sin away. And Father God, there is healing in the blood of Jesus, that sicknesses will be healed now. Father God, I thank you that stiff joints will be loosened in Jesus' name. Father God, kidneys that are not functioning properly will function properly in the name of Jesus. A liver that is not functioning the way it should to be restored in the name of Jesus. Burning feet and aching uh, aching toes to go now in Jesus' name. Lord God, I pray that you restore full health from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Be healed this afternoon in the mighty name of Jesus because of the sacrifice and let Jesus be the one to take you by the hand and say, get up, take your mat and walk. And this will be our testimony as we say out loud and we lift our hands to the heavens that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. This afternoon... He's my Lord, and I love him so. One day he came down from heaven, and he walked this world just like you and me. He healed the broken hearted, and he set the captives free. Oh, the lame could walk, and the blinded eyes could see. Lord, and I love him so. 